is everybody doing? Good. Fantastic. Okay, that's not real reassuring, but at least it gets us off to a fairly good start. Uh, seriously, I welcome all of you to Salem as we gather once again in anticipation of the birth of our Lord. You know, I love what Penny put on the sign that we truly are a people in waiting. And that's one of the great messages of the church, and it's one of the most misunderstood messages of the church. Because people always believe that when we talk about Christianity, it is a completed act. It is an event that took place. It is a time in history. It has a beginning. It has an end. It has all of these things by which we normally record and understand history. But indeed, it is not something that we can reduce to chronology. It's not something that we can simply reduce to a calendar. Christianity is always a journey, a work in process, heading to that day when God's kingdom will be fulfilled in all of its greatness, all of its grandeur, and all of its love. And so as we gather, we always need to gather with expectant hearts. It is when churches and all of Christendom become so intent on gathering with expectation that we struggle. But if we gather with an expectant heart, with a heart expectancy, full of expectancy for what God can do in our life, then truly we are, we are the church. So how many people are in the midst of Christmas preparation? Hey. <laughs> I knew John, yes. <laughs> uh, well, I've still got, what's today? Today actually is the, uh, what, 18th? Mm -hmm. So I still have like six and a half days before I have to get started on Christmas presents. <laughs> As I've told the story before, the very first year we were married, I waited till Christmas Day to actually go out and buy Roxanne Christmas presents. And much to my chagrin, the only thing open was a Speedway gas station. <laughs> so she got the WD-40 that year, uh, which is the gift that just keeps on giving. But seriously, I think sometimes we get so caught up in the preparation for Christmas, we forget about the anticipation of Christmas. That's really what it's all about. So as we gather today, let us be about that spirit of anticipation. Let us be about that spirit of waiting for the coming of the Christ child. And let us be about that spirit that tells us that God is with us in every way possible. And so we begin today, as we do each day, the good people of Salem gather with this powerful affirmation. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Are there announcements this morning? All right, I believe that uh, church council will not meet tomorrow. That would have been our normally scheduled meeting. We will not meet tomorrow in the month of December. Uh, we are giving our members of church council the month off, but we will reconvene in January. Is that correct, Penny? All right, very good. Also, there are calendars on the back table. And we have our sign-up sheets, and once again, I encourage all of you to, to pray about what ministry you can take on in the church. Uh, all of us should be engaged in some ministry, and we'd ask all of you to give it serious consideration and prayer. All right, there being no other announcements, let us greet one another with the peace of Christ. Oh, oh such a big crowd, man. <laughs> All right, that was overwhelming. <laughs> Just like a Hallmark movie when that happens. I tell you. All right, let us be about the reason we have gathered today as we join together in our call to worship. Please stand as you are able for the call to worship, which can be found inside your bulletin. God spoke to Joseph in the stark silence of a dream. Joseph was a vessel of God's grace. Grace that would cause heaven and earth to touch. Grace, Grace that heals the human heart. Grace discovered and discerned in silence. Grace, Grace that transforms the world. Let us worship our God of abundant grace. We now join together to light our final Advent candle. And this week it is the Advent yeah. candle that symbolizes love. And I wanted today to combine our sanctuary light and the lighting of the Advent candle, because this morning our sanctuary light is in memory of Penny's mother, Flo Clements. 
who would be 107 years old. And I was asking Penny earlier, what is it that you love most about your mother, about Flo? And she said two things that I think are very meaningful and are very closely related to this idea of what true love is. She said, first of all, her mother's love of Salem. And that is truly significant because I think all of you who knew her probably would concur because this church is only here because of people like Flo who loved this congregation and who loved this fellowship. And also the fact that Flo was satisfied with what God had given her. She sought no more than that. And that is too is a classic example of love. So as we light this final candle, let us think about Flo as an example of what true Christian love is all about. Loving to be part of the body of Christ and recognizing our truest blessing is in life itself and life lived in community. So today we remember, not simply her memory, we remember the light that she continues to bring to this congregation. And each time we struggle, each time we have doubt, each time we have concern, we need to think of Flo and countless others like her, whose love for this church, whose love for God, whose love for Jesus Christ has helped us sustain for 179 years. So thank you, Kenny. Please join us in our opening hymn, O Little Town of Bethlehem, on page 230. We're doing verses 1 and 2 with an introduction. I noticed that during this time of year, if you watch on television, a lot of the television news shows, they always talk about people who are doing good things. Have you ever noticed that? Amid all the, the mass shootings and murders and crime and violence, they always put one story on about a person who's doing something good. And I guess the idea is to recognize that even in the face of what we have, what we face in the human journey, there's always that sense of joy. There's always that sense of God being present. There's always that sense of that something is right, even when everything else seems wrong. And that's why it's very important that as we gather as the people of God, we recall those times in our life when we are reminded that God is present. That God is with us every moment. We are never separated from God. We are never separated from God's presence, God's love, God's compassion. But there are moments when it becomes manifest. Moments when that becomes manifest in our lives. And we, we once again are called to see the radical, transforming power of God's love. And that's what joy is all about. And as I've said before, my joy this Christmas. Now this is not a joke. I'm not trying to be funny. Uh, if it was a joke, you'd probably laugh anyway. But I'm not trying to be funny. But my joy this Christmas is I literally have spent very little time preparing for Christmas. Very little time. 
I've spent very little time wondering about what's going to happen when our family gets together or the family feuds from last year are still going to be present. I spent very little time wondering about is the tree going to be perfect? Is the food going to be okay? I spent very little time wondering about am I buying people just the right present? So John, I don't want you to be disappointed this year. I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it. I already got tears rolling down my eyes. I, I think so, yeah. <laughs> but the reality is that's been a good thing for me. Because for whatever reason, I have no idea why, for whatever reason, because I've spent so little time preparing for the holiday of Christmas, I spent a lot of time opening my heart to the reality of Christmas. And that's really my joy today. And even though I've been a pastor for quite a while and I've studied and done all of these things we pastors do and I've celebrated in a variety of churches, this is really the first Christmas when I'm starting to feel that I could be in that manger, that I don't have to worry about the trappings. I don't have to worry about the accoutrements of Christmas. I can only accept the reality and the joy of Christmas and the wonder of Christmas. So that's my joy. Also, again, as we mentioned, we are celebrating Flo's 107th birthday, which is amazing. I think that's awesome. Because, you know, I always tell people when someone passes away, it's always still a good idea to remember their birthday. Because in that birthday, God gave us a gift. A gift of a person who would walk among us and teach us. And show us how to live a strong life amid the exigencies and challenges of the human journey celebrate that. So, joys, concerns this morning. Yes, John. Prayers for the, my cousin passed away, Barbara had AST. What's her first name? Barbara. Barbara, okay. When did she pass away? 13. Oh, I'm sorry, I did not know that. My sympathies. Yes. And then on the, uh, Yes, I was going to mention that. Who's that little the, the little eyes staring out there? What? The little eyes staring back there. Uh, yeah, we know. Okay. <laughs> you know? Uh, <laughs> yes. Little Tommy is in the poinsettias. Okay. Next year, little Tommy will be a poinsettia. Sorry. Not. Where's Waldo? That's just cruel. Uh, at so many levels, that's just cruel. All right. <laughs> Christmas Day service will be canceled. <laughs> but everybody at Penny's house. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right. Yes, Laura. Um. If we can remember uh, Jean Dockler this morning, we got a call about midnight that she was in the ER okay. um, and had another call and was being evaluated for them, having that pain. For Jean. Okay. Um, also for our neighbor Logan, who nope. we prayed for and was yes. in the accident. Um, he was to have surgery this week to remove the plates in the jaw. Okay. And, um, he got news that he is going to live with those forever. Oh, wow. So um, he's adjusting. That's he, good. He's 18. He's adjusting. Yes, he. Flexibility at that age, right? Also, I wanted to share uh, last Sunday, um, I got a call from my son. Who's 34 and was crying incessantly, and I'm like, oh gosh, he never, he never cried as a child. Right. And um, they lost Oakley, um, who's their Labrador. Oh wow. And um, we were all crying like blubbering idiots, yeah. of course, because he spent time at our house. Sure. And um, I went to the house, uh, 
and my grandson came up and he said, Grandma, he goes, you know he's in dog heaven. He goes, and if you just think about that, you won't be so sad. Yeah, that's cool. That's awesome. And it takes you back. Yes, it does. It's all in perspective. All right, very good, thank you. Anyone else? Very good, always good to see Lennon here. <laughs> Brings a smile to everyone's face. All right, let us pray. Everyone except for you. <laughs> Holy living God, we come to you today and we are grateful. We're grateful that we can be a people in waiting. And at times we have such difficulty with that idea of having to wait. We are challenged by the idea of having to not have what we want right now. But in that waiting, our love for you can be deepened. And in that waiting, our love for you, our love for you can be seen in the way you manifest yourself in our lives. We pray today in thanksgiving for the life of Flo Clements, for her ministry, for her love, for her service. We thank you that her light continues to shine in this congregation. We pray for those families who have lost loved ones, for Barbara's family, for, for Rick's family. We pray that they may be guided by your peace. And may they find great comfort in the legacy of lives lived well amid the challenges of human choice. Find hope in the promise of Easter dawn, a promise that was born on that Christmas night in Bethlehem. We pray for Marlene as she's evaluated for hospice. We simply pray now that your wisdom will guide her and her family. May they be bathed in your peace and covered in your mercy. We pray for Jean who has fallen again. May you hold her in your arms. Sustain that family. Strengthen them. We pray for Logan. We pray that in his young age, he knows that no matter what the circumstances, you guide him through. And may he accept even setbacks with strength, with peace, and knowing that you have walked with him through this entire journey. We pray all of these things in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the prayer of confession, which can be found inside your bulletin. Holy God. In silence, a man named Joseph heard your voice. Setting aside doubt and fear, he became the vessel of your grace, being eternally joined in your grand narrative of redemption and reconciliation. Yet we often fail to be silent in your holy presence. Our doubts and our fears cause us to harden our hearts to your call on each of our lives. You are our merciful God. Forgive us for those times when we have failed to stand in silence to open our lives to your grace. Like Joseph, send us forth to be instruments of your grace and messengers of your reconciling love, not in words, but in actions. In Jesus' name, amen. We now enter into time of silent prayer, a time when we are to feel and experience the fullness of God, away from those things in our life that impede us and limit us in our ability to feel that God is truly with us. You know, people often would say when we talk about it, historically when we talk about the incarnation of our God becoming one of us, they always say, well, where was God before? You know, there's this great period of silence when God did not speak to the prophets, to the Israelites. A period of, of silence when people said, where was God? But God was present. For it was not God who was in exile. It happened to be God's people. And sometimes I think we feel the same way. It is not, we think, well, God is not in our life right now because of what we're experiencing. Or God has abandoned us. Or God is angry at us. Or God has, has changed God's mind about us. But the reality is, we are the ones who often are in exile. And now during this season of Advent and as we enter into the Feast of Christmas, 
we use the word Emmanuel, one of the many names that we assign to Christ, one of the many names we assign to Jesus. But Emmanuel means, in its finest translation, God with us. And as we go to our Lord in this time of silence, I simply want you to think about those words. What does it mean in your heart when you say, God is with us? God is with you. God is not just with people centuries ago in Bethlehem, mangers in a field, or people in a temple. God is not with simply the fathers of the church. God is with you. And on the silence of your heart and mind, let God tell you what that means in your life now and what it will mean in your life. Amen. Amen. And I would, uh, I would suggest that as we enter into this uh, Feast of Christmas and prepare to celebrate the holiday next Saturday and Sunday, think about that, what that really means. We sing about it, we talk about it, we preach about it, but what does it really mean in your life to say that God is with us? And that may be a bit uh, transphetically transforming for you. Now, as I've said each week during Advent, rather than doing our traditional prayers of the people, where we are reminded of our mission of the church, what we do during Advent is I'm just going to offer a pastoral prayer based on the Advent theme for today. And today's theme, of course, is God's unmerited, unconditional, and radically transforming love. Let us pray. Holy God, love is born of your grace, true love. It is not a love of choice, nor a love that we merit by behavior or action or thought. It is a love derived solely from your mercy toward your own creation, a grace-inspired, a grace-led mercy that caused you to walk among us, to come to us as a child, helpless, born in a manger to walk among us to reveal the truth of your kingdom. The truth of your kingdom and to help us understand that love is indeed a power. It is not a fleeting emotion, it is not a transitory feeling, but a power 
a power that can be used to change lives for the mightiest army in the world, the most prophetic words, the greatest treasure, can never stand against the true power of love. And we pray today by the power of your Holy Spirit that we may be a people of that kind of love, called to carry the presence of your Son to the world in acts of compassion, acts of mercy, and acts of grace. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We now bring forward our gifts. Please stand for the doxology. and persecution and marginalization. Cause us to be instruments of your love, people inspired by your grace, and people called to a new reality, a transforming reality, through the power of the incarnation that we prepare to celebrate on this Christmas day. Lead us to carry forward the cross of your Son in ways that heal, in ways that comfort, and in ways that open all hearts to your reconciling love and the message of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. This morning's Old Testament reading is from Micah, chapter 5, verses 2 through 5. But you, Bethlehem, David's country, the runt of the litter, from you will come the leader who will shepherd rule Israel. He'll be no upstart, no pretender. His family tree is ancient and distinguished. Meanwhile, Israel will be in foster homes until the birth pains are over and the child is born, and the scattered brothers come back home to the family of Israel. He will stand tall in his shepherd rule by God's strength, centered in the majesty of God revealed, and the people will have a good and safe home for the entire world will hold him in respect, peacemaker of the world, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please stand for this morning's gospel reading. Today's gospel is from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 24. Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man. Because he didn't want to humiliate her, he decided to call off their engagement quietly. As he was thinking about this, an angel from the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because the child she carries was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all of this took place so that what the Lord had spoken through the prophet would be fulfilled. Look, a virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did just as the angel from God commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he didn't have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son. Joseph called him Jesus, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. <laughs> Isn't it interesting how on this, the final Sunday of Advent, 
Just think about it. One week from today, it will be Christmas. And as you know, there will be a single service here at 10 o'clock on Christmas morning that Penny will be presiding at. And I think it's going to be a really, really wonderful time to come together as a family after our 11 o'clock service Christmas Eve here, which is also a combined service with Church of the Four Seasons. So I think it's a great time of fellowship, of celebration, and of recognizing the great gift of Jesus. And so it's interesting today, though, that this is the day during Advent we talk about love. Because that's a word we use so often in our world, isn't it? That's a world we use. Think about all the things we say we love. Okay? We love sports teams, right? We talk about loving sports teams. Everybody knows I love the Buffalo Bills, right? And I hope we all watched the game last night. Of course not. Thank you. Of course not. Of course you wouldn't. That's fine. <coughs> That's fine. As my Aunt Jean would say, God has a special place for people like you, John. I know. He does. <laughs> so do we. However, think about, think about one thing about human love, though. It's always made on the basis of a choice. Okay? It's always made on the basis of a choice. We choose who we are going to love. And sometimes that's a difficult choice. It's a very difficult choice, but it doesn't mean that we're bad people. It simply means that in our own mind, there is a criteria that we have established for who we are going to love. And then there is a hierarchy of that love. Certain people we love more than other people. Certain people we seem more compassionate about, compassionate about than we do about other people. And so if I were to ask you today, it would be a hard question, wouldn't it? What if I were to say to you, do you love me more or John more? Nope. <laughs> no comment from the <laughs> Okay, all right. <clears throat> I think from now on, put in the bulletin, this is not audience participation. <laughs> and just say, Judy, and this means you. <laughs> Seriously, what if I were to say that? Do you love Laura more or do you love me more? It's different. What? It's different forms of love. See, that's the point. The point is we always make a choice. We make a choice about not only who we are going to love, but how much we're going to love them. You know, if you are standing behind somebody at the line at Strax, and they're a couple dollars short on their bill, you may reach in your pocket, give them a couple dollars, say, here, I can help you out. And that's some form of love at a very low level. But you don't love them the same way you would love your spouse or you love a child. And when we see someone in need, we make a choice as whether we're going to help them or not, don't we? Think about when you walk down the streets in Chicago, and I used to, my office was in downtown Chicago, and I would walk down by the um, federal building. As you get past the federal building, there would always be this line of homeless people. And they would have signs basically saying why they were homeless. Very poignant signs. But people would make a choice, which one of those homeless people would get help? Which one of those homeless people would you reach out to? No one said, I'm just going to show God's love to all of you. You make a choice. We all do that, myself included. We make those choices as to who we are going to love. But then here's another aspect that sometimes we forget God doesn't make those choices. Think about that. The person who is sitting on the street in Chicago with a sign that says, please help me. God loves as much as the person who's devoted their life to ministry, to the priesthood, or religious life. The person living in the most astute are the most acute, egregious, involuntary poverty God loves as much as those who hold the key to the treasures, earthly treasures of this world. And that's the love we talk about at this time of Advent. 
And think about the whole nativity story because there, the entire nativity story is there not just so we can have Christmas pageants, not just so we can, we can celebrate Christmas or put a nativity scene in the front of our house. The nativity story is there to tell us about God's love. And let's think about it, all right? First of all, God chooses the two most unlikely people to proclaim that God is going to be with us in a new way, in a, in a way different than God was with the Israelites before. God was going to be with us, not in the voice of a prophet. God was going to be with us, not in the ritual of the priest in the temple. God was going to be with us, not in the sacrifice in the temple. God was going to be with us as a human person. God was going to be with us in the life of a helpless child who would grow to minister and heal and ultimately die on a cross for our sins. God was going to be with us in a different way. And so God begins by choosing the two most unlikely people, Elizabeth, far beyond childbearing age. And in the eyes of the world, in the eyes of the world, she'd been disgraced. God's grace wasn't with her. God's grace wasn't in her because she couldn't have children. And then young Mary from a small village, really a peasant, a young peasant woman. God chose two very unlikely people. And then here comes Joseph, the person we know nothing about other than he would become the earthly father of Jesus. God chose Joseph, who was very human, and we know he was very human because when Mary told him that she was with child, he doubted and he was going to send her off. He was going to divorce her because when you were, as they say, betrothed in those days, it was the same as being married. It's not like our engagement and then marriage. It was They were married in every sense of the word, and Joseph could have divorced her, humiliated her. She would have been shamed possibly stoned as an adulteress. But God chose Joseph, a carpenter, to do that. God chose shepherds to first hear the message. God chose a manger in a tiny town of about 300 people. That's what Bethlehem was when Jesus was born. God chose people in that tiny town to be born in a manger, Jesus to be born in a manger, God being with us. And so the message was, God doesn't just love the powerful. God doesn't make those choices we make. God doesn't have to because of God's grace. And sometimes we forget that, don't we? I know sometimes we will look at one of the things I can recall. And, uh, you know, I can recall I've done many Christmas Eve services and many midnight services in two different denominations. And I can recall that sometimes when you have your regular churchgoers on Christmas Eve, and then you'll have the people come in who they've never seen before, the people who may look just a little different than the normal congregation. And you just see the looks. When you're standing up in front of a congregation, you can see people looking at that, that person in the back whose clothes are a bit tattered. Or you see a person looking at that at that woman who's obviously never been in church before and doesn't know what to do. That's the reality that people see. And that's called making those choices. But what God does is God reassures us that God doesn't have to make a choice. God does not choose to love you because you are more religious. And I know that may come as a shock to folks, but God doesn't. You know, I'm sure that when you get to heaven and standing before God, God doesn't say, you know, I was checking the attendance at Salem. And, you know, you really were pretty weak for about half the year there, you know. God doesn't do that. Or God doesn't say, you know, your financial giving really, really kind of went downhill there where you lost your job and couldn't pay your bills and you kind of stopped giving it. No, God doesn't say that. God says, I love you in the most real, in the most powerful kind of love you've ever experienced. That's what God said to Mary. That's what God said to Joseph. That's what God said to the shepherds. And that's what God says to each one of you. So as we have gone through Advent and we've looked at this cast of characters, do you see anyone in that cast of characters that was anything other than human? That was anything other than a person, flesh and blood like you and me? 
No. You had Joseph, a carpenter, from an out-of-the-way town. Mary, a peasant young woman. Elizabeth, an old woman who thought she was disgraced in the eyes of God. You had shepherds, the lowest of the low. You had a tiny town of Bethlehem that just barely had 300 people in it at that time. And God's love was real. And so if you ever doubt that God loves you, if you ever doubt that God's love is not a power that can touch you and change you and transform your life, if you ever doubt that God doesn't care about you, then think about that. That God came into this world in lowliest state. That God loved those the world rejected. God loved those the world hated. God loved those because God's love is God's power. And during this time of Christmas, if we can stop and think, that's the fundamental message of grace. That God's grace doesn't see our accomplishments. God's grace doesn't see our bank account. God's grace doesn't see our position. God's grace doesn't see our ministry. God's grace doesn't see where we live. God's grace doesn't see our race or our gender or our ethnicity. God's grace sees us as God's creation. Beloved, an object of love and an instrument of God's love. So if there is one gift that we can take from the nativity, it is the gift that because of grace, God loves us. And the only thing that will ever change that, and God has never changed, is when we put ourselves in exile from God. And so if during this time of Christmas you feel a bit exiled, if during this time of Christmas you feel that you are exiled from God, open your heart, even if it's in a tiny, dark corner of a manger in your life. Open your heart and feel what it means to be truly loved. Feel what it means to be loved without cause, credential, or criteria. That's the beauty of Christmas. That's the beauty of grace. That's the beauty of being able to say, Emmanuel, God with us. Now you notice I did not ask you, do you love little Tommy more than me? I thought that would have been an unfair question. But nonetheless, but nonetheless, let's think about that. And let's think about that now in a very special way as we, as we celebrate communion. Because Ask yourself this, who do you invite to share a table with you? During the season, many of us will have family gathered at our home. And we, those are people that we have invited to share a table. God invites us to share this table. And in inviting us to share this table, God, God offers to us a special means of God's grace. God offers to us a special means of God's grace. And today, on this final Sunday of Advent, what I would like us to do before we enter into the great prayer of concentration is I would like to just spend a moment and ask for God's mercy and forgiveness. Holy and living God, as we come to the conclusion of Advent, our hearts have been filled with anticipation. Our lives have been filled with a sense of joy, but yet, too, we are filled with questions. With questions. We pray now for you are a merciful God. Forgive us for those things in our life that have caused us to turn away from you. Forgive us for those times in our life when we have failed to show your compassion. As we prepare to celebrate this sacred meal, bathe us in your mercy, cover us in your peace, and guide us with your wisdom. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord. 
of his suffering, death, and glorious resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread in his sacred hands. He gave thanks to you, Father Almighty. He broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples as he gives it to you this morning, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. And each time you do this, do so in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup again. He gave you thanks and praise. He gave the cup to his disciples as he gives it to us this morning, saying, Take, drink from this, each of you. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant that is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And each time you drink of this, as we will this morning, do so in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit in us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we may be the body of Christ for a world redeemed by his blood. Make us one with Christ, one with one another, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. <laughs> and now as we prepare to celebrate this sacred meal, let us join together in the prayer that our Lord and Savior gave us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The table has been set. The invitation given, all are welcome to come and receive.
closing prayer, which can be found inside your bulletin. Almighty God, as we gather today, our lives are filled with preparations for Christmas. Yet, in your mighty word, we awaken to our inescapable need to be silent before you, as did your servant Joseph. Send us forward today unafraid to answer the call you have placed on each human heart to be a builder of your kingdom and a vessel of your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join us in our closing hymn, <coughs> O Little Town of Bethlehem, page 230, and this time we're doing verses 3 and 4 with an introduction. <laughs> I forgot to mention, again, please try to attend one of our two Christmas services here. I'm just so excited about the fact that we are coming together to do that and that there will be a service on Christmas Day, which is, uh, I think, very, very important. And I just thank Penny immensely for agreeing to preside at that service. Also, this coming Wednesday, something I did forget to mention, at Church of the Four Seasons, we are doing a longest day service at 10 o'clock in the morning. And as you know, we've been conducting a grief group and a couple people from, from Salem, people who may have had a rough year this year, who have lost loved ones, who have had some kind of loss. It doesn't have to simply be a, a death. It could be loss of a job, loss of a relationship, whatever it might be. And many times when people are celebrating and they're joyous and having all these things for Christmas, sometimes it's hard to do that when you're dealing with this sense of loss. And so we have what's called a service of light. It's going to begin at 10 o'clock in the morning. We're having it in the fellowship hall in the Agape Center. It'll be followed by a light lunch. But the idea is that in Christ's light, we do not forget the losses in our life. No more than did the first followers of Jesus forget the cross. But we also remember the empty tomb. We also remember that that light is a light that heals, transforms, comforts, and guides. And so please, if you are feeling some sort of a loss, you know someone who is this year, uh, please feel free to join us. Um, it's, not, it's not going to be high church. It's going to be a very relaxed, informal remembrance of what it means to say, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Now, it is my distinct blessing to ask us each to remember God's blessing. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ touch your hearts in ways that heal, transform, and comfort. May the love of God surround and protect you in all human circumstance. 
granting you this promise of eternal reconciling love. And may every step you take, every word you speak, every labor of your life be done in full communion with God's Holy Spirit. Let us go in peace to know that we are people richly loved by God and people called to reflect that love to the world. Go in peace in Jesus' name. And it is fitting that we conclude today as we do each day with this powerful affirmation. We are a people loved by God. May we live as a sign to the world of God's love. Now, there are two, because we really couldn't decide on the special music. Uh, there are two songs listed for special music. I believe, Donna, we're doing the first one. Yes. Which is a beautiful song called The Thrill of Hope. And those are two words we normally don't use together, thrill and hope. But when we talk about the incarnation, those are two words that seem highly compatible and complementary. So please, take this time simply to reflect on what it means to feel that thrill of hope because you know that God loves you. So here.